The Vikings draft is in the books. We're about uh, uh, six days afterward, and a lot of Minnesota has transitioned to the Timberwolves, and rightly so. <clears throat> but we're going to do some of the Vikings stuff tonight. Sally, we can even get her takes on the Timberwolves here before the end of the show. Again, rightfully so. But let's jump into some of this draft stuff. The Vikings onboarded seven new players in the draft, 17 from undrafted free agency, and somehow this team keeps like figuring out the hack to get the league's best undrafted free agents I just don't understand how they keep doing it. We'll take it. Um, but the Vikings in round one got JJ McCarthy. They didn't have to didn't have to trade a King's ransom like we thought they might have to. And then they did trade a little bit of a ransom for Dallas Turner, uh, pick number 17. So Sally, I'm gonna start with you. I can't remember the exact year that you were ready to try something different at quarterback. Uh, it's a long <laughs> uh, time ago. 2016, uh, 2018. <laughs> All right. So as soon as the uh, the other era started, I want to know from you. <laughs> going to go into the draft party and all is the solution that they have proposed now with JJ McCarthy. Does this fit your criteria for yes, let's get excited. Yeah, absolutely. I think my stance pretty much um, has been that I trust what Kevin O'Connell um, thinks is best when it comes to the quarterback position. Although I was a little confused about the guy last year that they drafted, but I digress. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do trust his knowledge in that and he knows his playbook um so yeah i think it's really exciting and i agree with you it is a relief that they didn't have to give away um mm -hmm. as much as we all kind of expected my only concern is that possibly i mean if drake may really was their guy and they in their mind maybe made a little bit of a leap um to like a stretch to get um JJ and that wasn't necessarily what they wanted, then that kind of bums me out. But um, regardless, I think that it's great and it's exciting and it's the most excitement we're going to have in a while <laughs> when it comes to, you know, analyzing stuff. Are you, Sally, willing to go with Sam Darnold for however long necessary? Or do you, would you just rip the bandaid off and do the thing right away with uh, JJ M? No, I, I think it's going to depend, you know, how he develops at training camp and in the preseason and, and evaluate then. <laughs> I have no problem with them starting Sam Darnold for as long as they feel like they need to. Um, I would rather them do that than rush JJ in and him be unprepared just because they want to see what he has in that uh, environment. I think we're in good hands because it's my opinion there is zero chance that the Vikings rush uh, JJ McCarthy, it might be the opposite where we get impatient that they're taking too damn long. Um, it kind of reminded me last year when Jefferson was recovering from the, ha the hamstring injury and every week they're like, yeah, we want to ramp him up and get him ready. And then we were like, Oh, now he's not playing. I think they're going to be well, not yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, I feel like there, this is a different situation than yeah, that because is. I think that we all have realistic expectations that they're not going to be great this year. Mm -hmm. So especially with where the rest of the division is at, so there's not going to if even if Sam Darnold goes in and he isn't that good, um, then I don't think it's going to be. It's not like it's a huge step up to go to a rookie, rookie quarterback from him, probably. Yeah. So I, where last year they're in a playoff hunt, you know, so <laughs> it was important to get the key players back. Yeah, I agree. I think that I think it will be Darnold. We'll probably talk ourselves into. McCarthy looking good enough in the summer to, yeah, maybe we should just do this, but I don't ultimately think the Vikings will do that. BMAC, you notably played with a couple of rookies, uh, quarterbacks, that is, in your career, whether it was uh, Traveris Jackson or I think Ryan Tannehill you talked about before. How different is this thing uh, now that you're going to have eventually have a new guy in there? How exciting is it? How different is it? Uh, let's hear it. Um, it's, it's definitely exciting because you're, you look forward to seeing uh, what they bring, you know, what they have to offer. Um, the difference probably for them are they are now back on the young end of the totem pole where they just left being like the senior and everything. And now a lot of guys in there are a lot older than them or have a lot of years under their belt. So they have to um, kind of come in and gain, I guess, the respect of the veterans who basically that's who you'll be giving orders and dictating a lot of things too. So they got to start getting comfortable with that. When you have a new quarterback in the locker room, whether it's a rookie, we <laughs> talked a lot about Favre in 2009. Um, how soon can you tell if that guy is going to be it, if he's going to work in this offense or this locker room from a player's standpoint? 
I mean, with somebody like Adrian Peterson, I could tell right away. Um, mm -hmm. I just knew that he needed to get um, the pass protection part down. Um, then I knew he would eventually take a position. Um, so you can see like a lot of glimpses of things in. They make big plays, so they keep making consistent plays. Uh, you can see, um, okay, there will be a force to reckon with. Ron, let me ask you on McCarthy. Um, I was team Drake May. Uh, I think my cutoff was three first rounders, and if they had to do some pick swaps or shit like that, then so be it. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm very still elated with J.J. McCarthy because we spent two months thinking that no matter who they got, they'd have to trade up to at least number five and spend at least two first rounders and perhaps more. So when they ended up with McCarthy for just a fourth and an extra fifth rounder with the Jets, it felt really sweet. What is your enthusiasm, Ron, on McCarthy? <clears throat> so I think I'm kind of in the same boat. Like I, I had them very similarly ranked um, the way I viewed it. I think, again, looking at it in this system, I'm not talking about what May is going to be like on the Patriots, but with where we're at here with the Vikings, I think May has a higher ceiling, but McCarthy has a higher floor. I think McCarthy has those intangibles, um, you know, and like – I know the biggest question mark with Drake May is his footwork. He gets kind of those happy feet in the pocket. And I know that can be coached, um, so, so they say. Yeah. Uh, but it seems like McCarthy is more polished, um, but a lot more potential to be tapped and a lot more unknown. Because Drake May, you know, not this past year. Because if you recall, before this college football season started, like I was on Drake May, um, like mm -hmm. just from what I saw the year before as, as a, um, a freshman when he came in. So <clears throat> I, I'm glad that they didn't mortgage the future. Um, you know, and again, three first round picks is a lot. Um, it's, a, it's a lot more when, once you put the name to it, like knowing that we got Dallas Turner as mm -hmm. the second part of it. Like, you know, that would have, in my mind, that would have sucked to have to get rid of or to not be able to get Dallas Turner and then be in the in the same boat next year without a first round pick. So I love the value that they got. And I think that, again, the there's a lot to be tapped into here with McCarthy. Um, and, you know, it sounds like from what everyone's saying, all the quarterbacks wanted to come here, and there's obviously a lot of reasons why. And, uh, you know, even Harbaugh, so much to say in his press conference, talking about how this is where J.J. wanted to be. So it's uh, um, I think that that's a plus. Um, I think he's going to work. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not saying it's going to work out because who knows talent level-wise, but if it doesn't work out, it's not because – you know, he's not putting in the work. I don't see that. I don't see him coming in like Christian Ponder as a rookie when they said, you know, he walked in like he owned the shit. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't see that happening. Um, obviously, he comes with the credentials, <laughs> you know, winning the national championship uh, and having back-to-back, -back, you know, fantastic years at Michigan. So, um, you know, we'll see what happens, um, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to get, you know, a couple 21-year-olds with the first-round picks. It's uh, almost like – you get a first round, you get two first round picks next year as well, just with that potential. I keep saying this. I'm going to reiterate it on this show. <clears throat> if you employ Kevin O'Connell and Josh McCown, two former quarterbacks, you have a young general manager who was bold enough to pull off both these moves. And then you have Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison, TJ Hawkinson, Christian Darius, Brian O'Neill. If McCarthy doesn't work, I don't know what will at quarterback. I mean, everything is tailor-made for somebody, especially him with the, the QB wins, for somebody to succeed. So if this one is a swing and a miss in two or three years, we're like, yeah, this guy's only mediocre. I honestly don't know what plan could have been better uh, in terms of finding the quarterback. Uh, Sally, let me ask you this one. The Atlanta Falcons could have ruined everything for the Vikings if they were just a little bit wise. Um, I guess they were they were bold and determined to adhere to what they call the Green Bay Packers model. It's a weird rendition of it, but they're they're trying it. That's how they described it with Cousins and now Michael Penix. And I've talked to a couple folks in the last week. Do you have any idea why the Falcons, if they were going to do this, hey, let's steal the Packers idea, why would they go with the oldest quarterback in the draft? I certainly can't answer that. I think we were all very surprised by that pick. I know everyone that I was surrounded by at the draft party was very surprised. I, I mean, look, the Green Bay Packers recipe for success or whatever, I don't I don't think that that – I mean, when else have we seen that work out? Um, it, it's really strange at this point in the game for them to take that on, and 
as we know, Kirk Cousins' contract was monumental. And yeah, so the, there's just a lot of conflicting things going on there. I honestly couldn't <clears throat> tell you. I don't know. I don't know what's going on in Atlanta. Yeah, it's it's really odd because Cousins is like one of the the few quarterbacks that would probably be unnerved by yes. a rookie. Most other quarterbacks, I think, would be like, oh, we're doing this, huh? But it seems like Cousins would be the one guy out of how many quarter, starting quarterbacks that would be paranoid about it. So I can't Absolutely. wrap my head around it. <laughs> Absolutely. We know that he needs like mental stability, not a lot of conflicts or or somebody on his coattails we know that he's a regimen guy he likes to know what he's walking into and now <laughs> i think that's probably turned upside down for him um mm. probably has a lot of distrust in coaches in general just based on what he's been through mm -hmm. um so uh, really weird situation <laughs> It's also right. hard to like, replicate, you know, the, the the way the Packers have done it because Packers have always been a good team picking at the l end of the draft or back part of the draft. So it's easier to take a flyer at that point and be able to justify it rather than, hey, we have the eighth pick. We our defense needs help. We could get the best defensive player that we value on the board, but no, let's go with the the twenty four year old quarterback. Uh, so that that's the part to me that's baffling. <laughs> Where was um, Penix um, projected to go in a lot of the mock drafts? I don't think they say he would have fallen farther than uh, the Raiders. I think the, the Raiders at 13 were the was the floor, just how the draft played out. But the other part of it is I heard, um, I can't remember if it was Pelissero um, or Gessling talking about how the Vikings had McCarthy and Penix very similarly ranked. And it, <laughs> if McCarthy wasn't there, it would have likely been Penix at 11. So um, I think Penix has – talent i think he's going to be a, a good quarterback um but the spot just doesn't make any sense yeah we're gonna have to wait to see and he'll probably be 27 by the time he takes over which is a little awkward that's that's what we would have had if it was hendon hooker in the vikings last year so it, did. it didn't make sense to me either when i was there watching because i knew like <laughs> that um they just got um you know our guy so i was like how did you just pay him like what 150 180 million 180 yeah, to go and get this uh first round use his first round draft pick for another quarterback. I was like, that's odd. One theory I have heard floated out there that maybe there's validity to it that um they you know may have gotten wind that they're not that they're gonna lose their four, first round pick next year for the potential tampering. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then you know, to get out in front of it and be able to, you know, get their quarterback in now in a, a very let's call it green quarterback uh, uh, draft. Whereas next year, you know, I think there's what um, Shadur Sanders and Quinn Ewers are the, mm -hmm. the top prospects. Otherwise outside of that, it's, uh, you know, more, looking more like that Kenny Pickett year. So <laughs> if that were the case, that makes a little bit more sense, but even so, yeah, it's, you pay any free agent that much money. Um, I don't care what position you shouldn't be, unless it's like a, a rotational piece, like an edge rusher or cornerback or wide receiver. Mm -hmm. I don't understand drafting that spot. Yeah, the the plan, if they really wanted to do this, which evidently they did, I could have understood it and hated it if it would have been McCarthy because he is just turned 21, folks. Um, and he's almost five years older than Jaron Hall, four or five years older than Jaron Hall, if you can believe that. And Younger. But, yeah, excuse me, younger. Yeah, what am I talking about here? My bad. I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> what? If... if that would have made a little bit of sense because if they wanted to do what they call the Packers model, by the time J.J. McCarthy was weather, re ready to take over for Kirk, he would have been about 23, which is perfect. Uh, but they chose the guy, who the oldest quarterback in this class, to do it. And uh, I don't know why I keep thinking about it. I keep thinking about how that was the one thing that would have screwed up this Vikings draft if you were, you know, believed in that binary choice between May and McCarthy. Uh, Sally, what else on this draft? We had uh, Dallas Turner taken in round one, and then we had a long little drought, Kyrie Jackson, cornerback, and then we got a kicker. Anything else that stood off the page about the draft that you enjoyed? Well, one thing we definitely have to make sure we talk about is Bryant's experience in Detroit. Oh, we yeah. hear all about that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think we were all shocked when, when they traded up to 17. <laughs> I was... Um, you know, the one thing about 
the Vikings having a higher pick was being at the draft party. You were kind of rushed for time. And I was there. Uh, the Vikings asked me to go to shoot content. So I'm like, all right, great. Like everyone's going to be, you know, I'm going to have all this time to, to go get this done. And then they go ahead and trade up and <laughs> everyone was just shocked. Um, really relieved. I mean, they didn't, I don't know, like they, they did give up some to, to get Dallas, but uh, who cares, right? Like they were building a, the team for the future here. So um, you guys know how I feel about drafting specialists. So I think that um, we also have a little bit of PTSD with the Daniel Carlson situation um, because that could have resulted in stability for a kicker for us for a long time, which is hopefully what we're finally going to get here. <laughs> so um, while I don't typically like that, I am excited about this one because we see how Daniel Carlson ended up turning out. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, um, Will Reichard has the all time record of points that he took from Daniel Carlson in college uh, for points scored. Really? Yeah, yeah, that's the guy that he passed last year. I don't remember which which month it was, but yeah, he passed. Oh my god, I didn't know that. Oh yeah, the, the, yeah. <clears throat> Even though it's taboo to draft kickers, the Vikings drafted the very best one from the collegiate level. The guy can hit from fifty. He's pretty consistent. He doesn't miss college extra points. So uh, we're gonna hope that that other curse, the kicker one, uh, is complete. Uh, speaking well, it's gonna of, be yeah. weird. It's gonna be weird to not have a battle for kicker at training camp. Well, they say <laughs> Parker Romo. I I think it might be one of those battles like we had last year with Jack Pelesny when it was over by like May something. Um, I just don't think there's any way that Parker Romo, the XFL kicker, can beat out Reichard because it'd be kind of embarrassing for everybody, Reichard included. Well, see, and like I know, like the, as far as draft capital on a kicker, like kickers for me are like like in the sense of positional need quarterbacks if you don't have one you should always try to look for one in the draft and with kickers the fact that it's almost like doing a fantasy football draft where one once that first person takes there's going to be a run yeah. <laughs> like but so why not if you don't have a justin tucker if you don't have a harrison butker one of those elite type guys why not every year in the fifth sixth round just take a stab at the best college kicker just to see what you can get because you're going to need a kicker and the likelihood of a, a kicker, you know, meeting value and, you know, having an impact on the team is probably greater than, you know, a rotational guard that's going to come in, you know, due to injury. So um, I'm all for it. Like, hopefully it works out, but you know, who knows if it doesn't do it again next year. Who cares? As long yeah, as it's not second round Roberto Aguayo or something <laughs> like that. But. Yeah. Our lesson learned from last time, and it will be hard to do, is if Reichert goes through a rut, we as fans have to be like, tough shit, we got to stick with him. Uh, because none of us, I don't, I didn't know you guys at the time, but I'm pretty sure everybody was ready to move on from Carlson after that Green Bay game. So if we, if, if we, if we encounter something from Riker, we gotta, we gotta be patient. Um, well, I think we have a coaching staff and that yeah. has more patience. Like Greg Joseph, for example, like he was very, unsettling when it came to extra points <laughs> um, and they, they stuck with them. So um, I, I, you're not going to get that knee jerk reaction with Zimmer, um, you know, that he had. So we'll wasn't it at happens. the end of September too? It was the second game. Yeah, it was Yeah, right in the middle. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? We were all ready to move on. They were really, it, it was a bad game. Like, of course, caught, I was uh, there. <laughs> I know how bad it was. I was there. 90 degrees. Yes, it was a god awful, but he's a rookie <laughs> kicker mm -hmm. that you drafted. Yeah. Well, maybe I'm basing my uh, interpretation on social media. Um, I think it was also because um, the guy who was available, um, I can't think of the cowboy, former Cowboys guy, Dan something Bailey. Um, Bailey, like he was the all time. Mm -hmm. Um, record or all-time yeah. leader in field goal percentage at the time. So I think that was more of the the concern was, you know, we're looking to potentially, you know, make a run this year and we have a guy who cost us a game. Let's go get the NFL's all-time leading, you know, percentage-wise kicker in that in history. And then Bailey was good for a year yeah. until he wasn't. <clears throat> That's yeah. just the story of our lives. <laughs> he put on the purple. <laughs> yeah. Bryant, uh, yeah, let's let's hear about it. We I had to cancel last week because I had a, a meeting that came up. <clears throat> And it went long, I should say. And then you told us you were in Detroit. So tell us about how that all went down. So the NFL Players Choir got the opportunity to perform 
alongside the Detroit Youth Choir. Um, so the Detroit Youth Choir had probably like a 30 minute set to open up day two of the um, draft. And we came on probably with the last eight minutes of the set and joined them with um, a three song mashup. And uh, we had to learn dance routines because <laughs> they danced to every syllable. <laughs> so <laughs> we were going to like look crazy, stand there singing while they're like moving everything. So we had to learn, end up learning a little bit of choreography in those two days, pretty much. Um, the first day we were there, the first day, I had, I had took like videos of the green room and stuff like that, but they were saying don't post it until like after the fact. Okay. Um, so we were back there. Um, there was 275,000 people. <laughs> yeah, God. At draft day. Mm -hmm. um, it was really packed. Um, it was it was cool. It was like nice energy. It reminded me of the Super Bowl atmosphere, like the NFL experience and all those type of things. Um, that's my first time ever going to the draft since I was drafted. So I, <laughs> I, I actually, when I was there, um, Tom West from the Vikings realized, he was like, you're in Detroit? I'm like, yeah, I'm here with the choir. And when I was there, I was like, I should probably, like, I'm, I'm open with like, announcing, uh, you know, one of our selections in like one I was year. waiting for that. I was waiting <laughs> to see that. Like, right, when so you said you were in Detroit. So next year, what's crazy is next year's at Lambeau too. Yeah, um, lovely. We talked about that, so maybe next year I'll do that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you should. <clears throat> um, yeah, you definitely should, but I want them to put you in a funner, more fun city. Right. Oh, yeah, I also told them I wanted maybe to our incorporate own. Um, our podcast more. I said, you know, the podcast is all Viking news, right? So it needs to play a part, especially if I'm a part of it and I was a Viking. Mm -hmm. We need to have more of a um, a presence at, you know, their, their draft parties. That's why I asked where y'all there because he, he had mentioned that as well, too. So we're trying to figure it out. Oh, okay. Well, at the draft talk party? To Josh. Yeah, whatever draft events they have. Like, if I'm not doing, like, next year, if we, the choir doesn't go there or if I don't do the pick or whatever. Or even because really the people do the pick the day two anyway. So mm -hmm. I could either, I could do either or. I could be at the draft party that first night and then the next day just go to Lambo, which is not, it's real close. Okay. Uh, yeah. I did uh, talk to Josh Metellus, got a chance to meet him at the draft party and, you know, brought up uh, or asked me if he wanted to join our show. And so I, my bad, I haven't reached out to him since, but uh, <laughs> he did, he said, he sounded interested. He said he was, uh, you know, always interested in, uh, in doing, uh, doing different shows. So. And then for my, I have a charity event. Um, I have a charity event next Thursday. Uh, the Vikings, they, they became a sponsor and then they sent like an autograph helmet from, I gotta tell you who it is, cause um, it was somebody from my team that told me, but it, it's a player. Current. Yeah, current player. What's the event? Addison, maybe or something like Jordan that. Jordan Addison. <laughs> who? Jordan Addison. Yeah, he's their first. The name yeah, he was their he was their first rounder last year. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a sweet sweet little get. All right, cool. <clears throat> I'm about to text event? real quick and, and make sure that's who it is. Yeah. What's uh What's your charity event? Uh, for mental health awareness, you know, May is mental health awareness oh, month, yep. so mm -hmm. this is my second year doing my mental health awareness panel. Yeah, okay. is it in Miami? Yeah, uh, okay. Holly, basically Hollywood, but you're down here. Cool. And one more question on the draft, Brian. Like, so you said this is your first time there since when you got drafted in 2001. What are some of the Big biggest production. differences? Big is it, production. Is it... <laughs> it's totally different. Like, I was looking at this, I said, this is like. Um, the lighting and everything like when I was there, it was just like scaled down. It's like a big, like they have highlights for everything. They just have it's like more of a production for us. TV It's almost like a concert a little bit, and then like, <laughs> they did have people um, performing as well too. Somebody else performed while we were there. Did the green yeah. room feel different too than from what you? Remember? The green room. Um, there weren't a lot of prospects. Like, when I was there, they were like you know, tables and chairs, but now they had like, you know, like love seats and just different things. Like they were just set up a little different where before you were sitting at like a table in the chair, right? you know what I mean? Right. A phone on the table. It's just more decorated. And I'm pretty sure they have sponsors who help sponsor some of that stuff. So it's like product placement around and things like that. But it's just more lit up. It's just, it's more of a production. <laughs> Didn't you get drafted at like noon? Yeah, so that's the difference too because <laughs> it's like twelve noon and draft comes on, so it's like I got drafted probably like around one o'clock, um, and I'm then over. you fly right out. Like where theirs is at night, so they probably don't leave until the next day. Like I did press there at the um, Madison Square Gardens, and then immediately there was a flight. Like 
there was a car that took the airport and there was a flight already like lined up like they had a timed out perfect so that's a little different did um were in did any like clothing companies and stuff reach out to people to dress them or i can tell now that that's a big thing too um you know with social media so a lot of guys probably had different suits and tailors you know so people can advertise you know on tv especially if they're going to be you know on the draft or, or there so i'm pretty sure there's a lot of companies reach out to those guys where that form of marketing wasn't big yet because we didn't have social media when i got drafted and the nil i'm sure that a lot of these guys probably probably cut deals uh prior to the draft <laughs> i just want to know what you would have worn brian if, if the designer made you something i'm just something, something nice and who's like somebody would pick somebody who was popular too and like <laughs> read some real nice like something to stand out <laughs> for sure yeah you got to right yeah at noon <laughs> well, you were also drafted in an era where uh like the the big G2. baggy suits were a thing right? the baggy suit, yeah <laughs> <laughs> like that Carmelo Anthony commercial. Have you seen that? The 2003 draft fit. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. I got one more question for you guys, Ron, I'll start with you. So what we have about four months until the regular season starts and all you're going to hear pretty soon is whether or not it's McCarthy or Darnold right away. That will be um, just a beast honey talking point. But I want to know from you, Ron, what is one other big storyline that you will monitor between now? we got the schedule release in a week and a half, mini camp in June. What's one other Vikings thing that you're supremely intrigued about? You know, well, for me, it's how they're going to operate on the defensive front, um, just because lack of defensive tackle depth, really, like or at least no dominant name. Um, so to see who kind of comes out of there, whether it's Tillery, um, you know, Roy from last year, or, you know, the the Levi Drake, like that, that's going to be a hell of a story and to, see, to watch him. <laughs> but uh, so that for me, I, I'm going to look for that. Um, but also just – the the pieces like the chess pieces that Brian Flores now has to work with you know the adding Van Ginkle adding Cashman adding um, Greenard um, and then obviously Dallas Turner and then you know the undrafted guys um, I was a big Dwight McLaughlin fan um, just based on what I had read about him like I didn't think he'd go undrafted so to get him and Murphy where and I think like isn't the knock on Murphy they're saying that he doesn't have length but his twin brother was drafted in the third round so I would assume they have the same similar yeah, length Grayson. so. Mm -hmm. And they were both like very productive at UCLA, but one of them has sufficient enough length. The other one doesn't that baffles me, but <laughs> I think it's because Grayson is maybe an off ball linebacker. Okay. And I don't know if that makes a huge difference. And Gabriel's they more both of had edge. good uh, PFF pass rush grades. So, yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, again, I can't say I watch a lot of UCLA football, but you know, it's again, like he was one of the consensus top, undrafted guys so yeah to your point uh, from earlier with like ivan pace last year and yeah. murphy this year and um you know but but we can't give crazy any credit on those remember <laughs> like from last year that ar the whole argument but uh um so <laughs> I, i'm honestly like i think that for me otherwise the the biggest um underlying whatever headline that i'll kind of monitor all year is they're, well, on top of the extensions that are coming, obviously, I believe JJ will get done soon. Darisaw probably on the horizon or early next year, but um, how they're planning on that cap space for the off season. Um, like, cause that's, that's going to be huge because if they go, you know, four and 13, that might not be as enticing to free agents to come in, but if they're competitive or if, you know, they're showing like, Hey, like we're building something here now, all of a sudden, you know, you rather than missing out on a Christian Wilkins to um, to the Raiders. Now those top guys may want to come here because the money obviously, but now um, the situation is going to help. So that I think how we do um, at least perform, maybe not record wise um, mm -hmm. is going to be a big key to next off season. Okay. I I've wondered too about the defensive line, especially in the middle of it, thinking like they don't have like a true nose tackle Harrison Phillips, I guess can do it. So I was thinking about that this weekend, thinking, you know, after the draft, they don't have one. Um, and then I, I looked it up, and somehow the Vikings last year were a top five run defense um, from uh, yards per rush allowed. They ranked third best in the league. Total rushing yards allowed in general was sixth best. And so maybe this Brian Flores defense doesn't really need, like, just total high-profile gangbuster guys in the middle. And they have so much other activity from the edges and the linebackers um, because I was like, gosh, I hope we don't, don't get gashed 
on the ground, but they, that didn't really happen last year. That was more of a Donatel thing in terms of the run defense. So there was improvement. Uh, we'll see if it carries over. Uh, Sally, what's one other thing besides McCarthy versus Darnold, which will be talked about ad nauseum, uh, storyline that you got on your mind for these Vikings? Oh, man, I don't know. I think that that one's been so um, all-consuming that I haven't mm-hmm. even thought of what other – I mean, what else are we – Maybe who's going to be wide receiver three? I don't yeah. know. <laughs> no, that's a good one. Um, that's a, that one's always interesting. I mean, obviously, the last couple of years we've had uh, stability with that with KJ. Um, so yeah, that's going to be interesting. And oh, God, I don't know. What do you think? Um, probably once we get to the regular season, I'm interested to see how much of a split there is between Aaron Jones and Ty Chandler, because the Vikings, I guess, quietly didn't bring mm-hmm. back or didn't, excuse me, didn't bring in any more running backs. Um, and that was one of their weakest point was running the football. So I'd say how many carries or what Aaron Jones's workload, what he looks like. Cause he looked great down the stretch of the season last year. And then I think one of the, the more interesting ones, if you start to crunch the depth chart is defensive backs suddenly they have all kinds of decent defensive backs. Yeah, yeah. So two, at least one, probably two of Lewisine, Caleb Evans, Andrew Booth, two of those guys are probably going to have to get cut based on the way the Vikings love their safeties. And they're not going to cut Kyrie Jackson. They're not going to cut Makai Blackman. Um, Shaquille Griffin just got here. I guess he could be one of those guys who was signed and doesn't ever actually play and gets cut. But they we went from a spot before last year's draft worried about do these guys even realize they don't have many cornerbacks to having too many decent defensive backs they don't have any like real shutdown guys so that's the other one i'll be watching is how the secondary starts to come together because we just got we got a bunch of players what what i love too um if you recall two drafts ago the guy that i was asking everyone about that we had on from Jordan Reed to Charchi and uh, was Tariq Woolen. And again, I knew nothing about him other than that he's six foot four and he ran a four, three forty. Cause no matter what, you still got to throw over it. <laughs> and uh, so I love the fact that with Kyrie Jackson being six, three, six, four and Dwight McLaughlin, whether McLaughlin, you know, makes the squad or not, but you have, he's six, two as well. You have two big physical corners that can, you know, play man, play up and press um and then murphy can murphy and blackman um can play that slot role um and even chat griff or yeah Shaquille griffin um yep. he's a big long corner so i love that they're getting these big physical guys where you know it they're you're not getting prime Darrell Revis. You're not getting, you know, prime Patrick Peterson, but you're getting guys that are going to be up in the face of these receivers. And if you look at the receivers in our division, um, you know, outside of, um, you know, outside of getting Keenan Allen, um, and then obviously Roma Dunze, they're all smaller guys that if you get hands on them, like you should be able to at least be there. And uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Amen. Uh, the very last thing I have for tonight, Bryant, is for you. I think I've asked you something similar about this this time of year, but for any new listeners, we talk about uh, in July, uh, once once training camp starts, it turns into Groundhog Day for players. And then there's really no rest at all until January or February. So in these final two months, May and June, even though they, there is a mini camp in June, what do what do you guys do? What do players do? Do they, they take it easy? Do they get their last vacations out of the way? What is the final, I guess, eight um, weeks or so? There's always a six week break right in like June fifteenth to like uh July twenty seventh. It's always like a window around there. Six week break, that's when you continue to train, but you take your last minute vacations, kinda of get away and then get your mind acclimated to just going into <laughs> training camp and you just don't even remember which day it is because you do the same thing every day. <laughs> <laughs> and that isn't too well, far away, um, which is cool. We still have a whole summer to go, of course. But, yeah, we are five, less than five weeks from mini camp, and then the regular season is about four months away. Well, right. it's yeah. got to be better now now that they can go home and they don't have to stay in Mankato. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know I bring this up every time, but I still can't believe there is no air conditioning. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> I'll never get over it. Well, I want to hear about the undrafted free agents real quick. If you have a second, from me, yeah. You want to know what like your th- what your thoughts oh. are? Oh, okay. Well, first of all, I will reiterate. I don't know how the Vikings keep getting away with this. Um, two years ago, it was Luigi Villain 
who didn't turn out to be as good as Ivan Pace, but he was the big guy. Somehow the Vikings got him. Last year was Ivan Pace. This year is Gabriel Murphy and Dwight uh, McLaughlin. Uh, I think I figured out, and this was through a conversation with Josh Fry today. I think I figured out how they get away with doing it is they they'll extend their top 30 visits to everybody, to guys that aren't like necessarily at the top of their draft board. So they build that. They had a top 30 visit with Murphy, a top 30 uh, visit with a guy named Ty James, who's one of their new wide receivers. So I think they build that relationship. And then when, once that guy goes undrafted, when Quasi calls them, they're like, hey, yeah, we just talked to you a couple weeks ago. And so it's easy then. On Gabriel Murphy, yeah, uh, Ron nailed it. The knock on him is just like Ivan Pace. Uh, he doesn't allegedly have the, the strength or he only weighs about 200. He had 35 pounds. bench reps at the <laughs> combine. Like, I mean, okay. If it's about his length and the short arms, like, you know, because being able to put up 35 reps, but I don't care who you are. Like the, <laughs> the, the combine records like 51 and that's a offensive lineman. So don't, no one's going to tell me that he's not strong enough to play at this level. So, so he, uh, I think he's close to a lock on the, that's another spot that's suddenly deep is edge rusher. It's really weird, but uh, it's a deep spot with Andre Carter, Patrick Jones. And then of course, Dallas Turner, Jonathan Greenard and uh, Andrew Van Ginkle. Um, and then McLaughlin, um, he has the size like Ryan, Ron talks about. The only thing where I can find, and I still don't understand why this would have him fall out of the draft is that he might be undisciplined and prone to penalties, which, you know, of course we won't enjoy that in the heat of the moment, but, in terms of the scouting report or the tape, that's really the only weakness that could be gathered is that. And so those are, those are the two. There's 15 more. Um, but the other those part are, of that, mm-hmm. like you, you mentioned, that they bring these guys in for the top 30 workouts. And this is where for all those people who don't want to give Quasi the credit for Ivan Pace last year, like there may be even some of that where <clears throat> they are talking to these guys like in the fifth round on and everything. And there may be a point where – those guys are like, well, would I rather get drafted into a bad situation and have to work to make the team or maybe go to a situation where there may be a little bit more opening or flexibility or Brian Flores and that defense. So they, who knows what they're doing, but maybe they're just doing a good job of working the phones and, and everything and building that relationship. And like, Hey, if, if you go ahead and, you know, basically shy off some teams, which has happened before we've heard of players that have said, I'd rather go undrafted. Um, so Maybe there's some of that going on, and these high-profile guys are, you know, looking at it like, "Hey, that's a good opportunity for me just to advance my career." And I'll reiterate it that it is something. This is this is too many too too many years in a row to be a coincidence because uh, Valane, Ivan Pace, and now uh, Gabriel Murphy. It's really unreal. Like I'm just slating next draft. I'm just expecting for a big old UDA <laughs> after party. Who are we going to get? Just like the equivalent of getting a third or fourth rounder. That's the way somehow Quazy has figured it out. Um, all right, guys. We'll be back two weeks from tonight. We should have a schedule out by then, I believe. <gasps> yep. And then I'm guessing we'll have a Justin Jefferson extension to be happy about. Um, it feels like that is imminent. Uh, but that's all I got, guys. So we shall talk to you in two weeks, okay? Go Timberwolves. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Bye. Bye.